From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, who's first in defense, the U.S. or USSR? This year, the United States will spend more than $100 billion on military defense, once again a record high amount. The same is true for the Soviet Union, huge expenditures for the military. But is all this huge spending necessary? Does one of the two superpowers now dominate the other? What are the global implications of such high levels of spending by both countries? Critics say there's no need for the U.S. to have forces all over the world, that despite an apparent Russian lead in certain areas, that this country is ahead in overall strength. Others say the United States is falling behind. Some critics charge that the Pentagon always asks for more money than is needed, knowing that Congress will cut. Others insist it's all necessary. Welcome to another roundtable discussion presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Our topic is Who's First in Defense, the United States or Russia? Taking part in our panel discussion are four eminent experts. Melvin Laird, a former Secretary of Defense, former Congressman from Wisconsin. Mr. Laird is Senior Counselor for National and International Affairs for the Reader's Digest magazine. Mr. Laird served as Chairman of AEI's two-year National Energy Project. Thomas McIntyre, Democratic Senator from New Hampshire a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and chairman of that committee's Research and Development Subcommittee. Paul Nitza, a former Deputy Secretary of Defense and Navy Secretary in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. He has been a member of the U.S. Delegation on Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. Charles Mathias, a Republican Senator from Maryland, a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee. Moderating our discussion is John Charles Daly, a former ABC News executive. Mr. Daly also served for many years as news correspondent and analyst for CBS News. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, is basically concerned with two issues. Are we strong enough to defend our liberties and how much defense is necessary? In the early post-World War II period, our atomic monopoly ended, even as the Cold War brought confrontation with the Soviet Union. A national dialogue on our security has grown in urgency and complexity with the passing decades. Threaded through the dialogue over the years were the catchphrases, mutual deterrence, first strike capability, second strike capability, and more recently, essential equivalents, throw weight, and counterforce. In the election year 1960, more than 15 years ago, the specter of the missile gap was raised in campaign oratory, only to be quietly withdrawn when the battle of the hustings was over. In the election year 1976, the innocent word detente became an embarrassment on the hustings and missile gap was metamorphosed into muscle gap, the charge that the United States is falling behind the Soviet Union in military capability. Quadrennial campaign rhetoric aside, as we have moved in the last decade to detente, salt talks, and a concept of on-site inspection and limits on peaceful nuclear experiments, recent years have seen a dialogue of growing intensity, an earnest and deep probing, seeking the answer to our subject tonight, who's first in defense, the United States or Russia? Well, Secretary Laird, you have said the Soviet Union has engaged in a relentless effort to attain military supremacy. Have they or are they about to achieve that goal? Well, I believe that they're on the road. I do not believe they have achieved that goal now. In a quantitative way, perhaps you can equate their position as superior. But in a qualitative way, they are not superior to the United States this year. I'm concerned about the year 1982 and the period of the 80s. 
Because on weapon systems and on airplanes and ships, you're talking about four and five years into the future. And if you look at the program of the Soviet Union, that is the concern which I have this year. <clears throat> Qualitatively, the United States is superior now. Quantitatively, perhaps the superior force is the Soviet Union in certain areas. Senator McIntyre, you've noted in recent times President Eisenhower's conviction that the conference table, though scarred by many past frustrations, cannot be abandoned for the certain agony of the battlefield. Are we emphasizing, <coughs> pardon, are we emphasizing the battlefield over the negotiating table? Let me just first say that I really think that President Eisenhower was right, as he was on his admonition about the military industrial complex. So what I think is a shame that nobody out there is really talking about what arms are all about. We have an army and a navy and an air force that I think is one of the finest, and I have great respect for all of them that serve. And, uh, but we have that not to see how much we could win in the battlefield. We have that to deter aggression, to maintain our security. And therefore, I think that there's too much emphasis on the battlefield and not enough emphasis on getting to the negotiating table. The name of the game, if we're going to live in this world, and our, our children's children are going to be here, is limitation and reduction of arms. Mr. Nitze, you served as Deputy Secretary of Defense in beginning in 1969, served for five years as the representative of the Secretary of Defense to the United States delegation to the SALT talks, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks with the Soviet Union. How do you rank our respective capability for defense? If I were Mr. Ustinov, and if I conceived my task to be the same as the U.S. task as described by Senator McIntyre, I think I would be wholly confident and more confident than is Mr. Rumsfeld today. I think the problem is a different one. I think the Soviet Union has different objectives in the world than we do. And I think that there, if I were Mr. Ustinov, I would worry as to whether I had adequate capabilities now to carry out that more ambitious task. But there are all kinds of geographic differences, the differences of all kinds between the defense problems of the two countries. And I think before one can really answer that question, one has to go into more detail about the differences between the USSR, its geographic position, what it surrounds it, our position, what surrounds us, what we have to do. We're trying to support allies that are a thousand, several thousand miles away. Quite a different problem. But we will go into the detail and we can take, go into it further as the night goes on. Senator Mathias, your service in the Senate in appropriations on the Intelligence Committee with which you sponsored and the Special Senate Committee on National Emergencies and Delegated Emergency Powers gives you a very broad perspective on our defense posture. Is it adequate? Yes, I think it's adequate for this decade. Uh, I think it's too simplistic to, to use the catchphrases such as the fact that we can destroy the Soviet Union 44 times and they can destroy us only 22 times. But I think uh, more telling are, are the statements that were made to me not long ago by an officer who had retired after a number of years in Polaris that we're, we've got so many targets uh, now that we're running out of targets. Uh, we, we really have got a, an adequate defense. There, there are some deficiencies, some classes of ships, for example, that uh, we ought to uh, remedy the, the shortages. Uh, and I agree with Secretary Laird that there are trend lines that have to be watched. But I think our technology is uh, ahead. I don't think, I think it will continue to be ahead for a number of years. Uh, in short, I think there's plenty of defense. Uh, uh, if anything, maybe there's too much offense. All right. Mr. Senator? I'd like to <clears throat> pursue what Secretary Nitsi has to say. Um, Paul has been a member of the SALT negotiations and therefore knows, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one what it's like, and I have been spared that ordeal. But as we remember what Secretary Laird said, that um, qualitatively he feels that we are ahead, quantitatively that we're probably behind as we go through this. In certain areas. I feel there is no question that the United States is a superior force particularly as you look at the uh, techno technology that the United States possesses. 
we are far advanced uh, as far as the Soviet Union is concerned. I am concerned, though, about the tremendous ship construction program, the tremendous conventional weapon program that's going forward. And as you look at those trend lines, I, I do feel that it is something that the American public should be made aware of. Technological superiority is the important thing for us because it's the cheapest way that we can stay ahead of the Soviet Union. And those dollars in basic research and in technology that are being invested in the United States are very, very important because of the spin-off in other areas. But I am concerned that we are not doing what we should in that area. The Soviet Union is spending twice as much as we are in this area. Well, I don't buy that, doll. Well, let me, let, let's just look at it. The Soviet well, I Union, want to get a question to Mitsunitsi, and then we'll right. come back go to ahead. that. Go ahead. Let's come back to that. Then. And I'd like to go over that I Soviet go budget back. with you, then. Right. We have a very well-informed man here on this thing, and... Um, Anybody that served as Secretary of Defense as capably as you did is a pretty uh, formidable. But I, I wanted to get at I wanted to get at the fact that quantitatively and qualitatively, some say that we are about as close to parity today, you know, as we ever have. Now, isn't this the time for the president, whoever he may be, to drive hard? And you know how hard it is to drive, to drive the Russians to come to the terms of reduction and limitation of arms. Why isn't this the real moment? when we could possibly do it. I've spent five of my best years doing nothing else but trying to do exactly what you're talking about. And, we, and this is true not only of me, but all the others who were in, engaged on the U.S. SALT delegation. We literally devoted our lives to trying to do what you're talking about. And we got the support of Mel Laird, we got the support of, of uh, the President. Uh, and it wasn't that the U.S. lacked support for this effort. We've done our level best to get both limitations and reductions, and we haven't been able to do it. Now, why haven't we been able to do it? I think in part because the pressure on us for an agreement for an agreement's sake has been greater than it has been upon the Soviet Union, and in part because during these five years the Soviet Union has been deploying weapons at a much greater rate than we have, and the Soviet Union has not felt itself un under any realistic pressure to negotiate for a reduction. We've tried to get them. You can't get them by just saying, won't you be nice people? The point is that the, the position of the Soviet Union has advanced during the five years since I was Deputy Secretary of Defense to the situation that it is now. And the Soviet Union clearly wants that. And you people in the Congress haven't given us the tools by which we could accomplish reduction. Now, what do you mean by that? I really We've spent believe that. We've spent $83 billion of dollars in the last 10 years on research and development. <clears throat> well, now, let's, let's look, good let's chunk look of at this just a minute. I think that the senator, my dear friend from New Hampshire, is really <laughs> not facing the real point. <laughs> the problem that we have here is one of understanding what the Soviets are about. Time is on the side of the Soviet Union. They are able to devote a great amount of their resources to defense, twice as much as we are in terms of measurement as far as the gross national product is concerned. They are going forward at a rapid rate. Salt talks, arms limitation are to the advantage of the United States. They're a much greater advantage to us than they are to the Soviet Union. They live in a closed society. They're in a position where they can devote as much as they want to military spending. They don't have the pressures that we do in the United States, but they understand that. And when the Congress takes the kind of action that it does, and over the past few years they've cut $35 billion out of defense spending, the Soviet Union understands what's going on in the United States of America. They know that it takes all of this public support in the United States. The only reason we spend a dollar on defense is insurance. And every dollar is to either deter war or to defend America or carry out the four bilateral or four multilateral treaties that we have. Those dollars, I hope, are wasted. Mel, I, I would uh, take issue that... Uh, 
we aren't providing you with, a, with enough of the bargaining chips. I've never been too well persuaded that the bargaining chip theory was a very valid one to start with. But uh, we're funding defense uh, at a level of over $100 billion a year, uh, which is hardly unilateral disarmament. Uh, and I, I think I'd take issue, too, that the Russians aren't uh, feeling some of the economic pressures. Uh, I agree with uh, Secretary Nitze that we haven't found the, the magic uh, key to bringing the motivations which ought to drive both of us to an agreement. But uh, I don't believe that it's, uh, it's going to be found simply in escalating the defense costs on both sides. My Soviet friends were perfectly clear that the economic considerations were in their minds secondary. They were going to put their strategic considerations first, and they weren't going to be controlled by economic I'm sure considerations. sure as long as they can, they will. I don't but have any doubt of that. But why can't they continue? Well, Mac, you know, you were all for the volunteer force. I was for the volunteer force. We talked about it in the House of Representatives. It finally has become a reality. You look at the Soviets, they're spending 22% the, of their budget on personnel and manpower and labor costs. We're spending about 60% of ours on manpower, personnel, and labor costs. There's one point here, though. On, <clears throat> when you talk about mo spending money, that is not necessarily the way to become number one. $112, $114 billion will be the defense budget this year, a pretty tidy sum in our dollars. I think that we want to be sure, as we talk about numbers and money, that what we're really talking about here tonight, as I analyze it, the question is, who is first in defense? What you really mean is, are we second, and is our security in jeopardy? And to that, I would want to add that in looking at how many submarines we've got and how many, uh, what, how many missiles they've got that are bigger than ours, that we've got to take into context a few things that are very important that we learned. In Vietnam, for instance, we learned the will, the morale of the people is very important behind us. One thing that I think, and I say this critically perhaps, but I would have a hard time defining it, but we do have brilliant men, we need to, uh, to know what our place and our role in the world is going to be in the future. It's no longer post-World War II. You know, the times have changed. We need to, uh, to be able to, to be more selective. We ought to understand as you go and ask for this money, and God <laughs> knows that the, there's nothing wrong with the Pentagon asking for dough. They march up the hill every year, and usually march down with their bags mighty full. But all of this money they ask for, they ought to be able to tell us, what is our foreign policy? And define it. I like to know sometimes when they're asking for money, who's talking? The State Department? Defense? The President? Politicians? Uh, it, it gets to be pretty muddy. And so the thing I want to say... You're making an <clears throat> argument against this co-equal branch of the government, the Congress and the executive. Uh... I just want to say that the will of the people, uh, someone up there that is deciding what our role is, uh, someone who is realizing that our resources are diminishing, that they're not, they're not limitless. Uh, all of these things have got to be taken into account if you want to know who's going to be number one. It isn't a question of whether they got a standing army of, what, four million, and our army is, what, 1.3 or our armed forces. That, and, and the comparison between the two countries, there's no reason that our, our forces should be symmetrical to theirs. But mainly what I'm saying is don't go off on the question of who's got the biggest bang as to who's number one. I think we are number one, and I see no reason why we shouldn't continue to be number one for the next 10, 20 years. I'd, uh, I'd like to second uh, Tom on, on the point he made that I think we have to relate our military capacity with, uh, with our national policy. I've sat through too many briefings in which... Uh, It'll be laid out that we have to have the forces to control the Tyrrhenian Sea, but uh, nobody ever gives you any explanation of, uh, of uh, what the purpose of, uh, con of dominating the Tyrrhenian Sea may be. And uh, you sometimes get the feeling, uh, sitting on the receiving end of these briefings, that uh, uh, it's only for the sake of domination alone, and that's a very unhealthy kind of, uh, of attitude to develop. I'd like to give the Secretary a real opening, and, uh, and uh, Secretary Nitze too, because, and I see Admiral Moore, uh, one of our great uh, CNOs out there in the audience, but I used to say, and I, I'm a layman on this committee, you know, I'm, I'm just a country lawyer, and I don't know what they come in with these Pentagon boys with language, you know, it takes a whole year to learn the acronyms, 
Just a, you know, who's Sink Pack? You know, I said, who is Sink Pack? Finally, I found Commander in Chief Pacific. It was a great day <laughs> to learn something. But I remember when I said to Admiral Mora and his associates, you say we are not in the Indian Ocean. I would think you'd be happy and go to bed tonight content, sleep well, because you're not in the Indian Ocean. But aha, uh -huh. now there you are, opening. Yeah, Give it to me. Because they are really get at this. You know, what is the, today the strategic fulcrum in the world? It is, in fact, the Middle East. Because if the Middle East be goes, you know, becomes under Soviet hegemony, now what happens then to Europe, what happens to Japan? These are the points that we're really trying to help defend. But what does happen to them? And what really controls the, the access to the Persian Gulf, for instance? It is, in fact, the Indian Ocean. And why in God's name isn't it important as to whether or not one can maintain lines of communication through the Indian Ocean? Are you interested in Japan? Are you interested in Europe? Are you interested in the United States? Are you interested in the defense question at all? Well then, by gosh, you've got to be interested in the question of what happens to the lines of communication across through the Indian Ocean up to the Persian Gulf. You're saying that our role in the world today and the next 10 years is the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, the Pacific. What I'm saying is that we are interested in our own defense and we're interested in the defense of our allies and that includes Europe and Japan. And if you want to suggest that our role our security will be in good shape if we just look to the borders of the United States and don't look to the lines of communication out. If you think that that is all we have to look at, then your task is easy. You're quite right. And if nobody has explained to you that there is some problem about foreign affairs which goes beyond just the defend of defense of our shores, I'd be amazed. Well, I don't I'm, mean sure that, this, I'm sure that the people that have come and testified before you, <clears throat> that what they've said has been approved by the State Department and has been approved by the President. It isn't just the Pentagon speaking to you on these things, not knowing what they're talking about. I'd like to add to that. Of, of course, our defense policy, our foreign policy must be to deter war, to defend America, those are the first two points of any defense policy for a free nation like the United States. But the third point, and it's very important, and if this hasn't been communicated to congressional committees, I'm, I'm really very upset about it. We have to defend and we have to be in a position where those other countries of the world that are linked to the United States for our own self-interest, and also linked to us through the four multilateral and four bilateral treaties, which have been approved by the United States Senate, that those interests are also taken into consideration. Uh, well, I, I don't want to in indicate by any manner means that I think we should retire to our shores. But I think when you look at our, our resources, when you think of the cost of weapons today, it must be costing the Russians more, too, some way or another. It ought to be hurting over there a little bit. They just can't go on forever if they've got a country with people that have to, uh, you know, that like a few of the good things in life. It ought to begin to bear on them. But as far as we're concerned, it seems to me that I think the Congress has established this and believes this. We cannot police the whole damn world, and we can't do it. Well, we Tom, I well agree with that 100%. We, can. we cannot be the policeman on every corner in the world. And I, I agree with that 100%. There's no disagreement. But there are certain areas of the world that we are linked to. Now, if we are going to repudiate our treaties, if we're going to repudiate NATO, if we're going to repudiate all of these things, as far as the world is concerned, that's a different question. I'm not willing to speak out for that at this particular time. <laughs> I believe that uh, we have to be in a position to protect uh, freedom in this world, to preserve peace in this world. This is the first time we've been at peace for many years. Senator Mathias. Well, I think Paul Nitz has raised a very interesting and, and useful point in, in uh, emphasizing the interlocking of foreign policy and our defense posture. And I think you have to weigh where we are in foreign policy. And, assessing who's ahead and who's behind, and uh, the Middle East is a, is a good test case. Uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, today uh, the Russians uh, have no real uh, base in the Middle East. They have some arrangements with the Syrians. They have uh, some naval rights in the port of Latakia. Um, they're, uh, but, 
but uh, they're in a very tentative position in many of the countries of the Middle East. Uh, they have some potential, some opportunity. There's a long coastline along uh, Libya and into Algeria and some... Uh, Perhaps uh, more important is Somalia, places perhaps, of that kind. But, uh, but uh, by and large, our, our position in that part of the world is not hopeless by any matter of means. And I think it's a good measure of the fact that we are, uh, that we are holding our own and, uh, and doing But that's very because well. we're strong. Without question, the I, I the have presence. no question, uh, Mac, about the position of the United and States I want us to, today. And I want us to continue to be But strong. you'll agree that we must stay strong. Uh, and there's no question about that. But another area that I'd like to emphasize <laughs> is intelligence. Now, in the intelligence area, we're competing with a closed society. And it's very important that the Congress of the United States does not destroy our intelligence gathering activities throughout the world. Because in this open society in which we live, if we're going to know what's going on, the only way we know that the Soviet Union violated SALT-1 is because of the good intelligence gathering activities that we had. And as soon as we called it to their attention, they changed. And we have to have that intelligence if we're going to keep and, and protect the American public. That's they were going ahead with ABM testing of uh, uh, radars in an ABM mode. We should have called it to their attention right away. We let them do it for two years. Then we went public. Then they stopped. Recently, they violated the SALT agreements again. We called it to the public's attention. They're making the changes. But it's only because of intelligence that we're able to call this to the public's attention and make them accountable, and that's the only way we can enforce, enforce any agreements with the Soviets. Well, that's a special well, area of yours. Yes, and I want, I want to say that I think as a result of the action of the Senate during the past 15 months, we will have a better and more efficient and more successful intelligence service than we've ever had before. Uh, the establishment of an oversight committee uh, is, I think, uh, long overdue. Uh, if it does its job, I'm convinced, Mel, that you're going to have uh, a better intelligence product, a better use of uh, intelligence uh, analysts, and uh, what will get to the desk of the president and the national leadership will be more useful than anything they've ever had in the past. If I may ask a question, the Center for Defense Information, a military-oriented think tank that is headed, as you know, by Rear Admiral LaRocque, uh, U.S. Navy retired, says that the United States is a strong military power, need not be stampeded by fear or lack of self-confidence. The center argues that the United States has significant superiority in nuclear weapons, that the United States Navy is substantially superior to the Soviet Navy, and that much of the increase in Soviet military spending in recent years has gone for purposes such as troops on the Russian-China border that do not directly threaten the United States. Now, how say you? Well, that's not all true. That's not all true. Not all true, but a lot of things there sound uh, sound all right to me. And uh, but what I uh, but what I uh, I feel that uh, must be said is that uh, has been re-echoed here that we are being challenged, and uh, we must meet that challenge by uh, continuing to to uh, to expend the money. But my complaint is that they want everything in the book. And I want them to be more selective. I want to know their decision. I know that I'm talking now about the Pentagon gang. And I don't mean that derogatively. Really, I don't. But they've got to come over there and, and answer our questions with candor. They've got to, uh, they've got to indicate that they're selective. Uh, so help me. Sometimes it seems to me they want the whole, the whole uh, curmudgeon. They want everything. And we can't afford it. And we must remember that we've got to have our Defense Department has got to be really looking hard at these questions and coming over and putting their case forward intelligently and with, and with real, real strength. Tom, I understand, I understand that problem, and I, I don't think there's any disagreement uh, that we have in that area. I remember when we've been on the other side in the Congress, I remember President Eisenhower calling Congressman Ford and myself down to the White House, and we went upstairs in the little breakfast nook up there and had breakfast and he tried to convince us that we should not be for accelerating the Polaris program over and above the recommendations of the Department of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy because we were going to vote that day. 
on an amendment to add money to the Polaris program. Now, he felt that we should go along with the Defense Department, go along with Secretary Gates. We decided not to go along with the Defense Department. We decided to accelerate the Polaris program. And I can tell you that a few years later, when President Kennedy faced the missile crisis, we were very thankful that we had accelerated that particular program and had gone forward. So the Congress can take leadership in this area. There's no reason that the Congress always has to be the follower. The Congress is co-equal to the executive branch. You have as much to say about it as the executive branch. Somehow or other, you well, always want to pass it over to some other... Now, let, 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 can I, much to say. Is, well, I, I've got, I've got one that, that we, we can use your help with a little lobbying in the House on right now. The House of Representatives in uh, this year's uh, budget for the National Science Foundation has slashed $50 million, which is a fairly paltry sum in, in uh, defense terms. $50 million for the National Scientation, uh, Science Foundation's basic research program. Now, you, this can be more important to national security than a, than a whole weapon system. In the, if uh, I'd like to put that whole basic research program over in the National Science Foundation. Well, I think the this problem is, is we're not spending enough. Well, that I'm area. trying to restore this money. That like is that. national and security. That absolutely. money that's spent there. I think the real national security of this country rests in the laboratories and the classrooms and the places where research is done to keep us ahead in technology. I'd like to comment on that. Because it isn't just R&D, or at least that part of it, which is experimental R&D. In order to be able to do anything within the next 10 years on R&D, you've got to be building hardware, and you've got to be building prototypes. And I think your committee, Senator, errs on the side of R&D, kind of in the never-never land of things that are being done in the laboratory, and won't let enough competitive prototypes get built so that you can really see which ones will work. Frankly, I think the Pentagon doesn't ask for enough in the way of prototypes. Oh. You know, you can, <laughs> I really do, I really do. You look and see what the Soviet Union is doing in the way of missiles, for instance. How many missiles do you think that they are testing now, and how many do you think they've got in R&D? Now, that's a very good point. How many do you think they have in R&D, and how many are they testing? It is, we are not developing any new ones compared to, with the Soviet Union at the present time. And they're right on testing. Missiles. Oh, missiles. We've got missiles of all types. There could be a, we have missiles that come back at radar. We've got missiles that seek out heat. We've got missiles that go from air to... I'm not going to give you the bibliography or the biography. But one thing I want to tell you, we are number one. I've said that, and I mean it. If we're going to stay number one, we've got to have the Pentagon people telling us what the priorities are and not asking for the whole book. And we've got to have, we've got to feel, for instance, I don't want to throw anyone, but here's one that really irks me. The Navy, I'm surprised it didn't come up tonight, that the Russian Navy is steaming all over the world and is going to take over something or other. Our Navy is still number one in quality and experience. We can do things the Russians don't know how to do yet. Mr. Nitsi, <laughs> come to one of the, the current terms. You've expressed concern about throw weight balance, the maximum useful weight that can be carried to a target by a missile. What is your concern in that area, throw weight? Well, I think that the best measure of capability, of potential capability of a missile, is in fact its throw weight. I don't know how you, there isn't any point in just counting numbers of missiles and saying that they have so and so many missiles or missile launchers and we have so and so many, when the difference in the capability of each missile really can be 10 to 100 to 1. And you're just counting apples as though they were oranges if you just count them as one. And how do, you in a, how do you, in a useful way, take account of the relative capability of missiles? I think that the, the only way that I know of that is fair and is observable, I frankly, throw weight is more important from an arms control limitation context than it is from any other, because it is the only observable characteristic which really bears some relationship to the relative capability of missiles. Now, granted that uh, what happens in the front end of a missile is also important. That is not observable. Now, the technology of the front end is, you just can't tell that by any intelligence means. But the, the, the things that have to do with technology, you know, they're, both sides are competing very rapidly. In the past, back in 1969, we thought that the Soviet advantage in throw weight 
was fully compensated for by our superiority in the technology of the front end of the missiles. But now with these new generations of, of Soviet missiles and the work that they're putting into them, it is not possible to say that our superior technology fully offsets that. I think it does today, but you can't say that it will in the relevant time period of 80 to 82. You really can't. Senator Mathias. Well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Paul Netsy and Mal Laird have seen one of these little devices. It's a nuclear bomb effects computer. And it does uh, help you to determine uh, what happens with a, a bomb of a certain size, uh, impacts within a certain range. And it gives you both the human and the, and the uh, material uh, damage consequences. Uh, we've uh, had no limit on our megatonnage. Uh, we can build bombs. Of, uh, we have had the freedom over the years to build bombs of any size we wanted. Relying on the, on the basic science which uh, underlies that computer, we've decided that we'll go for accuracy. And as this computer will tell you, you get devastating effects uh, with, the, with the bomb size, which we have chosen on our own option, uh, which we have the ability to land in, uh, with a high degree of accuracy where we want them to go. Now, uh, I think the Russians uh, uh, opted originally for the mega, larger megatonnage because they had less accuracy. They may have gotten better, but uh, initially they had to have bigger bombs because they'd had no assurance that they could land them where they wanted to land them. Say, Green Nitsi? One point I'd like to make. We made a decision in 1964-65. Mr. McNamara was secretary, and I was in the Pentagon working with Mr. McNamara, that we would not add to the number of our Minutemen or our Poseidon boats that we would instead go for higher reliability, higher accuracy, and MIRVI. And that was a and deliberate that. policy decision. That was a deliberate policy decision, and we did that with, for very good reasons. A, it saved money. That was one of the main reasons we did it, was because it saved money. But the other one was that we hoped that the Soviet <coughs> Union would aspire only to parity, and that if we stopped at some reasonable level, that then when the Soviets got to that same level, it would be possible or to negotiate limitations where we would both be at the same level of capability. And would, that's one of the important reasons why we stopped there. I now would, when we got to the negotiations, we were unable to do it. We couldn't negotiate it. I would suggest, gentlemen, we have opened great areas for questions from our experts in the audience and members of the news media. And uh, so we'll go to questions. There are no simple answers to questions about U.S. and Russian military strength. Can we, for example, compare superior Russian missiles in numbers and size with superior accuracy of fewer American missiles? Is it true that man for man, ship for ship, the Russians may have more, but the United States may have better? Who's ahead, for example, in technology? And what will be the relative positions in the 1980s? Now, to challenge our speakers, we call on the experts in our audience to question the members of our panel. Now, can I have a first question? Sir? My name is Joseph Hassan, Howard University. Uh, one of the gentlemen made the point that our three objectives are one, to deter war, two, to defend the United States, and third, to defend our allies. I did not hear in the discussion any references to the contributions that our allies could make to our defense, uh, collective defense effort. Would uh, somebody comment on that point? I think I made the statement uh, that you refer to, and I felt that we, the third point, uh, as far as defending uh, our allies and those people uh, that, uh, those countries that uh, we have an interest and our own self-interest is involved, uh, they certainly do have a responsibility uh, to be uh, helpful. I am uh, very much impressed with uh, uh, some of our NATO allies and some of the allies that uh, we have mutual defense agreements with. The mutuality should run both ways. I think the Federal Republic of Germany understands that the mutual defense arrangements uh, that we have, uh, there is a mutual responsibility which they have. Now, we have some problems when it comes to Japan and to certain other countries where we have, through congressional action, through executive action, limited the contribution that they can make. 
And I think that we should look at those uh, particular limitations that we've insisted upon. Uh, perhaps in the period of the 1980s and after that, uh, there is need to review uh, the responsibilities which they should share with us, which they are not sharing to the extent that they should. I'd like to add to that, because it seems to me this is one of the things that is different between the Soviet problem and our problem. Basically, I do not think that people in the world are frightened of any desire on the part of the United States to exercise hegemony. I think they really do believe that the United States, when it does intervene, intervenes because it is trying to maintain diversity in the world as against somebody coming in and trying to deny it and put them under firm control. The result of that is that I think we have much greater reservoirs of goodwill around the world, even amongst some countries that for the moment seem to be hostile to us. And so that I think this reservoir of goodwill around the world is one of the main factors that we have which can compensate for some of the disadvantages we have. I, I take a dimmer view as to the relative power position of the United States and the Soviet Union if it is measured just in the terms of weapons at the points of importance. But if one looks at it in this broader sense, I take a more optimistic view. Senator Mathias? John, I would accept for the moment uh, Mel Laird's uh, three categories. Uh, but I think we have to remember that they're constantly interwoven. That even in the defense of the United States, uh, there is a significant allied contribution. Take the contribution that the Canadians make. Uh, it's very important to our own domestic defense. So. While we can make these categories, uh, there is a significant interdependence. Well, I'd, I'd also like to add to that, uh, Senator Mathias, that in the early part of this program, we've only been talking about the nuclear deterrent of the United States and nuclear force of the Soviet Union. I think it's important for us to realize that that's a very small part of the defense budget. As far as strategic weapons in the budget currently before the Congress, only 8.4% of that budget is in the strategic weapon area. And where our allies can make a great contribution and where we must make a further contribution, it seems to me, is in the whole conventional area. And so in the conventional area, our friends in NATO and our allies in other parts of the world, I think, can make a substantial contribution there. We got into the discussion here of nuclear weapons and we had the calculator out and we discussed all these things. I'm really not as concerned now about the nuclear confrontation as I am about the need for conventional forces in the free world in order to keep the Soviet adventurism down to a minimum. And the conventional force is where our allies can make a tremendous contribution. And we shouldn't scare ourselves all the time on the nuclear end of the defense budget because it's a very small part of the defense budget when looked at totally. The Soviets are spending about 14.5% of their budget in the strategic area. We're spending about oh, a little over 8%. One other point, and that is our allies are spending $30 billion a year just on their naval forces. And this is a real contribution. Can you say that again, please? Our allies are spending, as my recollection is, $30 billion a year on their naval forces. Another question? Thank you. My name is Victor Lloyd. I'm with National SANE. Uh, the United States has quickly become the world's breadbasket. It's a world that includes the Soviet Union. And uh, taking this into consideration, shouldn't we consider our food producing capability a strategic weapon, so a part of our arsenal? <laughs> And thus isn't the whole issue of who has more or less military hardware, whose who's Avis and whose Hertz, really a moot issue. Can I uh, yes. say a word on that, John? Senator Mathias? Uh, I, I reject the concept that it's a, a weapon. I think I would accept the fact that it can be a very important instrument of our foreign policy. This is a strategic situation which I think requires policy at the very highest level in this country, and we have really only just begun to, to measure its impact on our defense strategy and uh, on our whole approach to the world. I think I want to add that as we today consider our strategic confrontation with the Soviet, 
that there are uh, many non-military matters that could very have a strong effect, and you've mentioned one, the adequacy of food, and I can mention another one, the availability of energy. Well, Senator McIntyre, you agree, though, that food is a weapon for peace, and it is a great weapon in the hands of the United States because we can produce food at lower costs with fewer people than any place in the world. Next question. Thank you. My name is Tom Dine. I'm a staff member of the Senate Budget Committee. There are now six nations in the world with uh, nuclear capability, potential 12 more uh, seem to be ready to develop if they have to nuclear weapons. I'd like to hear the panel discuss what military means and what non-military means can the United States supply if, for instance, a terrorist group gets a hold of some of these nuclear weapons or plutonium or a neighbor of ours, Mexico or Brazil, develops such an arsenal? Tough question. Anybody uh, like to volunteer? Mr. <laughs> Nedsey. <laughs> it's all the time. You mentioned, last of all, Mexico. I think it's an unfortunate uh, example, because I doubt very much whether the Mexicans would want to do that. But if one takes any country that uh, has developed a small nuclear capability, I really think it would be highly unlikely that that country would, in fact, use those nuclear weapons. But when, when, when it comes to terrorists, this is a different kind of a thing. Uh, but there, I think the real danger is that uh, terrorists acting on behalf of someone else, that is the thing which would frighten me. Because there, you know, let's say that the Soviet Union wanted to have some terrorists use nuclear, have, have the capability of nuclear weapons, be in the same role as the Cubans in Angola. You know, what do you do about it? This is a very tough one. But it just, uh, but I don't see what you can do about that. You're not going to cure that one by non-proliferation. You can only cure it by giving up certain liberties, too, in the United States as far as the kind of enforcement that you're going to have through local uh, police authorities, and you have to give up a certain amount of personal liberty. And there is a lot of problems involved with that. Now, the terrorist question bothers me. And it's a security problem of great import. And I don't mean to belittle the question because it is, it is a problem. But I think you have to weigh the amount of personal liberty that you give up in a country like ours if you're going to police that problem uh, to protect every citizen in the United States. Senator? Well, let me just echo uh, Mel Laird's last uh, phrase, uh, was it Benjamin Franklin who said that uh, he who will give up his liberty for security will, uh, deserves neither and will lose both. Uh, but uh, I think the question raises more really than the, the, the madman problem. Uh, the madman problem is with us in, in many aspects, uh, but what that question really raises is where we're going in the control of nuclear technology in the world. Uh, you say we have six members of the nuclear club today with a potential of, uh, of 12 more. Uh, that's a, a, a devastating kind of outlook for the world. Uh, as uh, the technology advances, uh, the likelihood is that it'll become more available, it'll become cheaper, it'll become uh, uh, accessible to more and more candidates for the club, and uh, the just the actuarial chance that some disaster can overcome the globe is greater with each new member of the club. Senator uh, Brock of Tennessee and Senator Cranston and myself have been making some attempts to bring about uh, Senate attention, focus Senate attention on this problem. And if I sound just a little evangelical about it, uh, I am, because I believe, to my knowledge, I'm the only member of the Congress who was at Nagasaki and at Hiroshima within uh, a matter of a few days after the bombs dropped there. I know what uh, those uh, tiny primitive bombs uh, can do to a civilian population. I've seen it. I've walked those streets. And uh, those, of course, are uh, many weapons by today's standards. And I feel uh, desperately that uh, we have to do much more than we have been doing not just uh, with the Soviet Union, but with the whole world community to bring this problem under control. Next question, please. 
Walter Davis, the Conference Board, Congressional uh, Fellowship Program. The talk of this trend line that the um, Russian uh, forces are, are taking, has there been any substantial dip in that trend line as a result of SALT One and the several other talks held since that time? My answer is short, no. The trend lines have gone in the other direction. Does the Secretary remember that when he came back from SALT One, I think it's right now, <laughs> that the Congress was, was very happy. SALT One had been attained, and he put a, a new figure in. He wanted, a, what was it, $100 million, $150 million more. And we said, you know, if we're going to have SALT One agreements, it seems to me we're going to reduce arms and we're going to keep a limitation. But a good old Secretary wanted $150 million more to keep things safe. I just throw that in to remind you that we didn't. We the secretary, secretary was talk. right. Secretary Laird, right? Secretary. secretary Laird was obviously right, because the provisions of that agreement were such that unless you did what Secretary Laird asked the Congress to do, you were clearly going to be behind the eight ball by the time it, you got around to renegotiating the replacement of the interim agreement. We must I, th I think I think we didn't the history, get history in some of these areas has proved that I was right on some of those large missiles that. Uh, back in 1969, too. Well, we don't have time to get into the fact that you backed us up on this accuracy stuff, which I still think is bunk. And, uh, uh, but that's been changed now. But I do want to give you credit. In 1970, you had, a, you had negotiation from strength, and I think that was one of the best things you did. And I, I give you credit for it now. Question from Admiral Mora. I'm Admiral Tom Mora, U.S. Navy, retired. I have uh, many comments to make, but they are not allowed, so I'll just address a question to Senator McIntyre. How would you describe to the voters that you intended to force a reduction in arms? I don't know I could describe how I'm going to force a reduction in arms, but I sure, in, in the name of hell, would have a plan that I was going to implement. I'm going to say, look, we're going to go. We, got, we think we're somewhere near parity. Now, we're going to get the best men we've got, not to come up with a, with a, with a, with a new kind of a missile, but let's see what we can do to get through the iron heads of Brezhnev and company, the fact that this way is going on our way to perdition if we keep going, escalating, more accuracy, bigger, more accuracy, bigger, and then someday somebody uh, blows the whistle. One more question. Right here. Lloyd Norman, Newsweek. We've uh, sensed tonight that we, we do have superiority today, that we are number one. <coughs> We've had atomic monopoly, as Mr. Laird has indicated. We've had uh, nuclear superiority for a long time. But what I'm puzzled by is the fact that we haven't been able to use this great military power to achieve our aims in the world. We were unable to turn back the control by the Russians of Hungary and Czechoslovakia, or the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. We haven't been able to do anything about the Vietnam situation and we weren't able to do anything about Angola. What use can we make of military power to achieve these political goals? Who'd like to start? Secretary? Well, it depends upon what our political goals have been. Certainly the defense of Europe has been, of European NATO, has been one of our important goals. If you start with the immediate post-war period, we, had, we withdrew most of our forces, and the European countries had virtually nothing and the Soviet Union clearly had superior force right there. What do you think enabled us to, to defend that line? I think it was, in fact, our nuclear monopoly, even though it wasn't very great. Now, when you get to other things, such as the Hungarian thing, there we didn't have any local capability at all. The question at issue was, do you want to go to a general war with the USSR to do that sort of thing? That isn't what the United States is about. It wouldn't have been consistent with our goals. Well, I think we have to look at what our goals were and where we had made an agreement to protect certain areas in the world. And I think in those areas where we have had agreements, the areas that you listed are not areas that we agreed to defend by any form of treaty. I think uh, there are people that want to go into all sorts of places and be the policeman. We have a presidential candidate now that wants to send troops to Rhodesia. Uh, I question the wisdom of that kind of action and that kind of statement. Uh, I think perhaps uh, we should develop, uh, I've always been happy with the 10th commandment, 
the Ten Commandments. Uh, I wasn't too happy about the Eleventh Commandment that was uh, put out by this same candidate. But I think perhaps as long as we've gone to the Eleventh, we better go to the Twelfth. And the Twelfth should be, one should think before they speak. And when you get into this business of Rhodesia, Let me I add. don't think there's enough thought given to that question. <clears throat> Let me just quickly add. <clears throat> what you point out is you say, with all this power, the question being number one is not who's got nuclear superiority <clears throat> or conventional superiority. It's who's got many other factors, <clears throat> morale, will. And we pulled out of Vietnam because the will of the people of this country said it's a wrong war. So all the nuclear bombs and everything else didn't amount to a dime. And the same with Angola. Congress spoke and said, no way. No case has been made. So we're going through this change. But I think it's important to realize that all the strength in the world doesn't mean necessarily a number one unless you've got the heart and the morale. Right. Our time is running out. One final question. Brian Benson with the Senate Republican Conference. I'd like to ask the panel, and particularly Secretary Laird, what you'd like to see happen to U.S. defense spending over the next five years. Secretary. I think it's rather difficult to make a projection on where defense spending should be during the next five years as far as dollars and cents. I think there's one thing, though, that this panel has agreed on today and uh, as in these discussions is that the goal of the United States is to preserve peace and freedom throughout the world. And if we are going to preserve peace and freedom throughout the world, we all agree that the United States must remain strong. Now, the measurement of how we remain strong is uh, for debate. Uh, you can debate the B-1 as compared with the FB-111. Uh, you can debate uh, various weapon systems. Uh, I think the important thing for us to bear in mind is that it's going to cost us some money, and we have to be willing to pay these costs. And if we pay these costs and remain strong, we will be able, I believe, I'm confident, to negotiate eventually reductions in arms throughout the world. This roundtable discussion, comparing United States and Russian military strength, has brought you the views of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many views in the hope that by so doing, those interested in the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036.